Hey guys, so I get a lot of questions about uh, lure making almost on a daily basis on uh, various social media and uh, recently most of those questions have had something to do with um, soft plastic lures so I decided to make a little video about um, the common problems that people have when it comes to playing with softies. Firstly I think I'll talk a little bit about uh, different kinds of molds. Basically there are two different types. The, uh, open pour mold, which looks like this, and a two-piece mold, which looks like this. And there's actually even a third option to choose from, and that is a, a three-piece mold, which technically it's a four-piece mold, but um, think of it as a, as a two-piece mold that has this upper section um, uh, changeable. You can have different sort of uh, tail options, you can have different sizes of tails in the same body, but uh, I'm not really going to go into that too much on this video because I don't have an example to show you guys. But um, which mold should you choose and why? Uh, for beginners, definitely the two-piece mold is way easier to manage. But uh, eventually you want to go with something more elaborate. And actually some, some lure types do require a two-piece mold, such as swim baits. I want to point out a few important points about the construction of the molds. Uh, first thing is the wall thickness. You want to make sure that the walls, meaning this part here, is thick enough to withstand the contracting effect of plastisol. I think most of you guys already know that uh, plastisol contracts when it cools down. So you want to make sure that uh, the wall thickness here is at least uh, one centimeter or one and a half centimeters thick. Uh, or else you're going to have this sort of effect happening and they're gonna have dents on your lure, which I think none of us want. Uh, secondly, where to put the pour hole. Usually always prefer to have it vertically like this, so that I pour the stuff uh, from the tail. But uh, sometimes I do have it on the head as well, it just depends on what kind of lure I'm making. But uh, the reason why I usually have it vertically like, like this is that um, there's less of, of a chance of air getting trapped in the details such as the fins. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about pouring and common issues that I've encountered and uh, heard of people complaining about in the various forums around the internet. And uh, I think by far the most uh, common issue that people has, have is that when you get those very small holes, they look almost like bubbles that have burst and sometimes you have your whole bed completely riddled with those. And uh, that is actually caused by a cold mold, and it's very easy to get around that issue just by preheating the mold with a heat gun, such as this. Or, if you're brave enough, you can always stick your uh, mold in an oven and preheat your mold uh, by, the, by that method. But uh, personally, I would not recommend for you to do that, sounds a bit too risky to me, like, a little bit too many things can go wrong with that, so... Uh, I would stay away from that. And the second, I guess, biggest issue that most people have is that uh, when you get those very huge indentions or voids on the side of your bait, um, you don't really get that too much with uh, smaller baits, but when you start to go big like this, oh man, that can be a huge issue sometimes. And uh, that is actually caused by the contracting effect of plastisol. Some plastisol, plastisol types have more of an issue with that than others, but uh, all of them pretty much do contract at least a little bit. And uh, that is pretty easy to actually get around with. So what I usually do is I actually don't pour the whole thing full. Uh, I usually stop around here and let most of this plastisol do most of the contracting that it's going to do. And then simply I just pour the rest after three minutes or maybe sometimes I inject the plastisol too, uh, depending on how uh, complex the um, tail that I have on the bait is. And uh, the second uh, solution to the same problem is that uh, you sort of like build this extra chamber inside the mold and what it does is that uh, the chamber is actually designed to uh, 
what it does is it, it allows the plastisol do most of the contracting that it's gonna do inside that chamber and I've seen that mostly done with uh, injection molding but uh, I think it probably would work with hand pouring as well um, and uh, how big the chamber should be um, I would say probably one-fifth of the volume of the bait should be enough. So depending on where you live you're gonna have uh, access to different types of Plastisol. And uh, personally I've used uh, four different brands of Plastisol in the past. Uh, currently I'm, I'm using uh, two different brands. But I'm um, not really gonna go too much into the differences between the different bl uh, Plastisol brands. Rather it should be pretty obvious that there's gonna be uh, minor differences between them. For example, some of them will float and some of them will sink. Um, my tip is going to be how to offset those properties a little bit. What I mean by that is that you can actually make floating plastisol sink and sinking plastisol float. So uh, first, um, how the hell are you going to make uh, floating plastisol sink? Well, simply by adding uh, some table salt into it. I think most uh, advanced soft plastic lure makers know about this tip already and um, it's actually pretty effective. Um, you don't want to use uh, rock salt by the way, just normal table salt and um, does have a disadvantage too. It sort of like stiffen up uh, the plastisol a little bit but you can offset that a little bit by uh, adding a little more softener into the uh, plastisol mixture. And um, how about making a sinking plastisol float? Well, if you have played around with uh, other lure making materials like I have, you might have uh, come across with something called micro balloons. And uh, it looks like this. Uh, this is something called Eurofill 15 and comes from Smooth On. And uh, what it actually does, it, it's uh, sort of like a filler that you add into the um, resin and it will make it float. So like with um, adding salt into the uh, plastisol this also has a diff disadvantage. Uh, you can't really use it with uh, glitter baits because it clouds up the uh, plastisol quite a bit. But uh, if you're playing around with uh, solid colors then it's gonna be just fine. So problems with painting or shading plastisol. I think um, I will start with the uh, shading first because that seems to be the thing that most people start off with when they start to play around with this stuff. So first of all when you add uh, different colors to plastisols uh, you want to make sure that you wait until it goes through the cycle of first being a milk like substance uh, then it goes into a sort of like gel like state and then it goes into a uh, flowing hot liquid and that is the time when you want to add uh, the soft plastic uh, additive color into the hot plastisol and also you want to make sure that you shake the bottle before you do that. Um, that way you will get the true color of the additive color into your soft plastic bait. Well how about when you're using uh, soft plastic paints uh, such as the uh, cap coating one that I'm using. Um, the annoying thing with um, pouring or injecting uh, soft plastic baits is that you always get this uh, oil like film on the on the bait and uh, most airbrushable uh, soft plastic paints don't really like that so my own solution is that uh, I put a little bit of um, dishwashing detergent into the water uh, when I uh, take out the uh, recently made uh, soft plastic baits and put in the water, add a little bit of this stuff into it and uh, when I later uh, take off um, the baits from the water I just rinse them off a little bit with uh, water and uh, seems to work pretty well with me. Let's move into more specialized problems like how to fix internal weight inside the mold and not have them moving around when you're actually starting to pour the bait. So what I've done is I uh, actually uh, bent these metal pins that are holding this uh, internal weight in one place and when I close the mold 
uh, the whole thing gets uh, completely and utterly uh, fixed into one place. And that is exactly what you want to have when, when you have some sort of internal weight. You definitely don't want it to move anywhere. Um, the second more specialized issue is when it comes to the durability of swim bait joints. And especially with uh, predatory fishes like uh, Northern Pike, uh, the durability is definitely an issue. Uh, they do destroy a lot of baits. And especially the joints are going to be uh, very much into uh, harm's way when it comes to pike. Uh, so what I've done is I've actually uh, attached these uh, fabric called tulle fabric inside the mold with uh, metal pens and these definitely do help with the durability of, uh, of the joints and uh, when I pour the soft plastic into the mold they get completely embedded into the soft plastic and uh, yeah I basically get a very durable bait. Okay the last issue that I could come up with is how do I glue my eyes on my soft plastic lures and uh, I actually use super glue this is Loctite Precision Super Glue and uh, I actually use this to mend some of my soft plastic lures after pike attacks too and works surprisingly well too. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's pretty much all from me now. I hope you enjoyed this uh, quick uh, frequently asked questions uh, type of video. Um, if by any chance I forgot to uh, address some issue that you might have when it comes to uh, making soft plastic baits, feel free to ask me in the comments section and I'll try to answer uh, to my best ability. Uh, so I guess I'll see you guys on the next one. See ya!